So apparently the sun is fake, or uh, there actually is a real sun, but it's hidden by a fake sun to distract us from the fact that the real sun's being eclipsed all the time by a bunch of planets right next to Earth. That'll do, I don't know, something bad during the biblical tribulation. It's not really clear. Regardless of the details, though, this simulated sun conspiracy stuff is wild. Today I'm looking at a channel called Universal News Media, who has 29,000 subscribers. That's pretty surprising. Actually, no, it's not surprising at all. Remember when this stuff used to seem really unusual? Like when we were all laughing at that lady who didn't know why there would be rainbows in her sprinkler? I'm just wondering what the heck is in our water supply? What the heck is in our oxygen supply of the me metallic oxide salt that create a rainbow effect in a sprinkler? What is oozing out of our ground that allows this type of effect to happen? Anyway, here's another lady making almost the exact same mistake as Rainbow Sprinkler Lady. Except instead of not understanding how rainbows work, this lady doesn't understand how cameras work. In both cases, it's just that they don't understand optics. And both of them seem to have the same goal, to make people afraid. In this case, specifically with the goal of scaring you into Christianity. We're gonna look at one of her most viewed videos called Two Planets, Huge Striped Fast Rotating on FAA Weather Cam. Frighteningly close to Earth. This received 250,000 views and overwhelming approval. Clear your desk because you will want to apply your head to it. Our first image was viewed by the South Facing Weather Cam in Onvik, Alaska. We're starting to see this striped planet frequently as it gets closer and larger. A striped planet, is it? Well, okay, that's a possibility, I suppose. Another possibility is just that because this is an outdoor camera, there's a water droplet on the lens. That lets you get the same thing, the bright arc with the stripes coming off of it. Look, I grab my camera and my flashlight and I stuck some water on the lens, and it's the exact same effect. So which option do you really think is more likely? That a bunch of stripey planets invaded my living room? Or that my lens really just has water on it? In Barrow, Alaska, from the southwest facing weather cam, not much appears to be going on. But notice the tiny white dot. That's the concealment jet that causes the oddly shaped reflections to swing across the screen, which we'll see in a moment. Just in case anyone doesn't see the jet, here's an arrow pointing to it. Spoiler, most of what we're going to see in this video is just a bunch of lens flares and dust specks and glare. But I think this jet is actually probably none of those. No, based on its appearance and its speed, I think it's something much more shocking. A cloud. Yep, just an itty bitty adorable little cloud. Now I could be wrong about that, I don't exactly have a lot to go on here, do I? But it doesn't really look like a lens flare shape that I'm familiar with, and it kind of looks like it drifts further away from the camera and gets smaller over time, and it just has that fluffy white cloudy look. Zooming way in, it even seems to arbitrarily change shape like I would expect a cloud to do. And it'd make sense based on the surrounding environment, it is a cloudy day and the wind is clearly blowing that way. If you look at the footage again, you can notice how a bunch of clouds closer to the camera are all moving in the same direction. The jet carefully follows the planet that the sun will be eclipsing shortly. The planet is nearly transparent in the atmospheric chemicals, but some contrast brings it into view. In this case, I honestly have no clue what you even think you're seeing. I guess your high contrast version shows some compression artifacts a little more clearly, but they don't look like a planet. I even took this image into Photoshop to try to find something myself, and even your compression garbage doesn't show up. It could be that it was in the original image, but then you rendered it, and then YouTube processed it, and it just ended up screwed up, I don't know. Either way, this example in particular is quite a stretch. I know you're hunting for patterns to fit your narrative, but in this case I don't even know what pattern you think there is. Also, notice the jet's reflection coming onto the screen from the lower right edge. Oh really? Where? I see a lens flare on the exact opposite side of the camera from the sun, like you would expect. Is that what you want me to see? Okay, what makes you think that has anything to do with the cloud? <sighs> Whatever, I see it. Now what I want you to see is how it's going to stay exactly opposite of where the sun is. Meaning, if the sun's a certain distance above the middle of the image, that reflection is going to be the same amount below the middle. And if the sun's a certain distance to the left of the center of the image, that reflection is going to be the same amount to the right. Just watch. The jet follows the planet, sending signals to the sun simulator prior to an eclipse. Oh, that's all you're going to show, huh? Alright, here's your whole sequence. And since that's all you're going to show of it, I'll demonstrate how it works myself. It's not going to look identical because the appearance of lens flares depends heavily on what lens you're actually using, but it should convey the general idea. 
For those who are new to this channel, I'll quickly explain the Sun Simulator. It's a very intense light source installed between the Earth and the Sun, much closer to the Earth. Planets involved in the many eclipses occurring daily pass in front of our real Sun, but behind the Sun Simulator, so that it's not obvious an eclipse is occurring. Points for originality, I guess. Well, if you were the one who came up with it, which I don't think you are. I'm not sure who's supposed to have set all this up. Satan? The Illuminati? I don't know. Probably one of them, because these videos are definitely Christian propaganda. We'll get to that later. We know that the Sun Simulator is not the real Sun, as the Sun Simulator moves across the sky, viewed from this weather cam in Drumheller, Alberta, Canada. It completely disappears behind a tiny street light. Most first graders know that our real Sun could never be hidden by a tiny object like this. Oh, the appeal to first grader authority fallacy. I thought only Kent Hovind did that. Anyway, this is why you don't trust first graders, or loons on YouTube who throw out nonsense claims without putting any effort into verifying them. So what do you say we take a look at these Drumheller cameras and see if we can figure out what's actually going on here, eh? Now, the first thing you should know, Universal News Media, is that streetlights are not tiny objects. Just take a look at these pictures of them being worked on. They're quite large. It surprises most people who find out about it. They're like a couple feet long. So the front half, which contains the bulb, you can think of, roughly speaking, as a sphere about a foot in diameter. Of course, the real size of the object doesn't matter much in and of itself. A tiny object like a dime held close enough to your eye can easily hide the sun completely. And a very large object, like an airplane, won't hide it at all if that plane's far away. What's important here is whether the object's size and distance together make it subtend a sufficiently large angle that the sun is obscured by it. And as it happens, that angular size is about 30 arc minutes. Maybe you'll tell me that the real sun that nobody's seen in who knows how long is secretly five times that size because the first graders who've also never seen it told you so. I don't know. But the only numbers I can work with are the numbers I've got, and you've given me no reason to think they're wrong. So we're going to assume that whenever Satan or the Illuminati or whoever got around to installing this sun simulator, they were forward-thinking enough to make the fake sun the same size as the real sun so that all those people who like to look at the sun with solar filters wouldn't notice. Which, if you think about it, kind of makes this whole argument pointless from the start, regardless of whether the sun is fake or real, because the sun is still clearly small enough either way to be hidden by that light. Unless maybe your point here is that streetlights somehow have the ability to make the simulation malfunction when they get between it and a random weather cam, and the sun simulator actually turned off for a minute. Either way, it's not exactly like you're clear about what your point is, so I kind of have to guess. Either way, I had a lot of fun figuring all this out, so we'll just go with it. Now, what you're seeing in the video here isn't just the sun. It's the glare from the sun in the camera, which covers a much larger area than the sun. You can see a similar effect here with my flashlight. By the way, here's a video I took showing just how different the sun's size can appear with and without all that glare. It looks huge here without a solar filter because there's so much glare, but when I add a solar filter, it's not so huge at all. That is the actual size of the sun in the sky, and that little circle is all that light has to be able to cover. So even though on first thought it might seem easy to just measure the patch of light and measure the streetlight itself and conclude that one is smaller than the other, thanks to the unfortunate fact of glare, that's not going to work. We're going to need to do some math instead, and fortunately we don't have to do that ourselves, there's a website that can do that for you. We can be reasonably sure that we know the rough size of the light. A foot diameter, give or take. But we still don't know how far away it is. So if we want an object that's one foot around to subtend an angle of 30 arc minutes, it has to be 100 14.59 feet away or less. What that means is if we can figure out how far away the light is from the camera, and it turns out that it's less than 114.59 feet, it's able to hide the sun. But if it's more than that distance, it can't. So place your bets. First, let's plug the FAA's coordinates for this camera into Google Earth. That's 51.5012 degrees north, minus 112.75054 degrees west. Now, that's going to tell us roughly where the camera is, but we're still going to have to correct the fine detail by examining the environment. So, okay, this camera is located at the Drumheller Municipal Airport, over by the buildings here. And just to see what kind of scale we're dealing with, let's use a ruler to get the total length of all the buildings together. Altogether, roughly 920 feet. Now we need to figure out where the light post is and where we are. We being the camera. And then we need to figure out how to tell how close we are to that light post. So first let's try to get our bearings. So since this airport only has this one taxiway coming from where the buildings are, and it's shown in our south facing camera and is clearly south of both us and the light post, we know we have to be a decent distance north of the taxiway. That building you see just south of the light pole seems to be the one across from and just to the north of the taxiway. So we'll place the light pole roughly here. 
here. And now we've reduced our possible distance from the pole to only about 400 feet. But we can get a lot more precise, because this FAA weather cam actually is two cameras, one pointing south and one pointing north. So let's take a look to the north instead. Alright, there's another light pole, and on the pole looks to be like a loudspeaker or something attached. And this light pole actually looks quite a bit further away from us than our light pole. Let me try to remove some of that fisheye effect to make sure. It's kind of hard to do perfectly without knowing what lens they're using, but I can get pretty close. And yep, the pole to the north is definitely further from us than the one to the south that we're interested in. That'll be useful. And that pole to the north is snuggled right up against the corner of that building there. And did you notice how high in the air we seem to be? Look how short the buildings and even those light poles look. We can see right over that building to the north all the way over to... Wait, what's that big building? Well, considering that the paved area ends right after it, it's gotta be the main building, right? In the satellite shot, it looks like it has a stripy top. Here's a better view of that building. So it's got kind of tan, corrugated walls. In front of it is a light post with another one of those loudspeakers attached to it. It's got the stripy roof, and it's got this little nubbin at the top, which is for ventilation, I assume. So does all that match the north-facing FAA cam? Corrugated, tannish walls, nubbin, light pole with a loudspeaker, and it's kind of hard to see the stripes on the roof, but yeah, it's got those too. So that's definitely that big building, which means the building that the North Pole is hugging the corner of is this one. And therefore, the roof that we see along the left edge of our shot is this kind of L-shaped building. And now we have some real good details to work off, because while the internet isn't exactly flowing over with pictures of the Drumheller Municipal Airport, I did find three that are pretty damn helpful. First up we have this one, just of some people getting ready to skydive in 1998. There's our pole from the north facing camera with the loudspeaker snuggled up to the corner of that shorter building there. There's the roof we see in the edge of the north facing weather cam. And there's the pole to the south of the weather cam that has the light that hid the sun. Now that taller building with the brown roof, there's only one building like that at the airport going by this aerial shot. So that's gotta be this building. You see that antenna attached to the side at the top? It's in the same place in the skydiving picture. And if I were to guess, I would say that's actually where our FAA weather cam is attached, which would explain why we're in such an elevated position. So with all this information, now we can get some rough measurements of how far we actually are from that light. From the north light to the south light is maybe 120 feet. Could be a bit more, could be a bit less, but it's roughly correct. And since we know the camera is closer to the south light than the north light, we know it's well within half this distance of the light. So not more than about 60 feet, and probably quite a bit less. And how close did the light have to be to the camera to be able to hide the sun? 114.59 feet. Even if you account for the height of the pole, which will increase the distance very slightly, there's still no way to get 114 feet of distance here. It's more like half that at best. So, yes, universal news media, regardless of what you believe to be the consensus of the most qualified experts from the first grade, this tiny object is entirely capable of fully covering the sun. In fact, even if the part that covers the sun is quite a bit smaller than one foot in diameter, it's still able to cover the sun because that light is at most half as far from the camera as it would need to be for a one foot object to eclipse the sun from the camera's perspective. Why don't you try putting in some effort to verify if your claims are actually true next time before you just leap to the conclusion that your faulty perception means there's a conspiracy to create a fake sun and the end is nigh. The sun simulator often has a black center but not always, depending upon what mode it is in and at what angle it's being viewed. This black dot is not a camera anomaly, it casts its own reflection upon the water as shown in these images. Well, it is a camera anomaly, or rather it's normal behavior for some cameras that have this problem. When just way too much light hits part of the CMOS sensor, it gets overloaded, and rather than showing all white, it shows all black. This even happens in some comparatively expensive cameras like Blackmagic cameras, which is why DaVinci Resolve has a feature specifically to fix this problem. But I'm not going to go out and buy a Blackmagic camera, and having a black hole at the center of the sun isn't exactly a feature that I can easily shop around for. Anyway, what I eventually settled on was a cheap 30 Canadian dollars Chinese knockoff dash cam, which apparently has this issue. So once I get a hold of that, I can do any experiment I need to do to demonstrate exactly why this claim is complete horseshit. But for the time being, this is going to have to do. Can you explain to me exactly how you think that light coming directly from the sun rather than light from its glare, because that's what that is, that's how big the sun actually is and everything else around it is just glare. What makes you think that if that light comes directly at the camera, it's gonna cause this problem, but if that light is reflected off a smooth surface and again directly into the camera, it won't cause this problem? 
But much more importantly here, you're not even right that it shows up in the reflection. I mean, yeah, you are sometimes. But watch, as the sun moves and the tide goes out a little bit and the reflection becomes less intense, the sun stays black and its reflection doesn't. If that black thing is physically there, it should be showing up in this reflection all the time regardless. But your own picture that you chose shows that it's not, meaning that there is definitely not a physical black object present in the sun and that it is in fact just a camera problem. What's your excuse for that? The southeast facing weather cam in Buckland, Alaska captured the striped planet. It is difficult to see without some contrast enhancement. Not gonna lie, that just looks like clouds. Like, at least with the lens flares and the reflection off water droplets and stuff, I can see why you think they look planet-like, because they at least have circular features. But this doesn't even have that, it just looks like clouds. The southwest facing weather cam in Chandler Shelf, Alaska, caught the gigantic tan-colored planet that is often seen on the Huna, Alaska camera. Barely visible, it is nearly transparent in the atmospheric chemicals. Oh, I wouldn't call it barely visible, I'd call it not visible. Because this is another one where I can't even tell what pattern you're reading into the image. Are you fascinated that the light's diffused a little bit? Seriously, I've been staring at this image for minutes trying to figure out what you could possibly think even looks like a giant planet here. I don't know, maybe I'll just let you continue, you might explain it. The sun simulator also has a blurring mechanism often applied when there are nearby celestial objects. But as the sun moves, moves closer to this enormous object, its tan color becomes more pronounced, even though it is still blurred. Moving the frames back and forth a bit does make it a, more obvious that something large and tan colored is over the horizon getting ready to set. No, it really doesn't. I honestly still have no clue what you want me to think is a giant tan planet here. Like I see the sun, I see the sun's light in the air, maybe diffused a little bit by some water vapor, and that's it. What else is there? There's no lens flares that look anything like what you're talking about. There's no visible dust specks, no water droplets, no clouds, no nothing. Are you gonna start telling me all about the pink elephants next? As the sun gets close to the tan colored object, the sun simulator's glare stretches toward the tanned orb in a further attempt to conceal it. Oh, like this? Honestly, whatever your name is, just pick up a camera and a light and play with them. That's all you've ever had to do to show yourself why none of this makes any sense, which makes me think you just don't want to know. By the way, when presented with an invisible tan planet, why would the best nefarious solution from the cosmos controlling Illuminati or whatever be to stretch the sun to cover it in the most obvious way imaginable and then, I guess, just leave it like that until the planet goes away? Does that really sound like it makes sense to you? This huge object sets to the left of, our, left of our sun every evening, causing a very red sky to the left of the real sunset. Why would a planet affect the color of the surrounding sky to that extent? Does it emit light? You know what, on second thought, I don't expect you to have thought about this hard enough to answer that, don't worry about it. I guess my second question would be, are you just complaining that a large amount of the sky is red at sunset instead of just the area directly around the sun being red? Like, you didn't show us a picture of what you mean, so I can't be sure exactly, but that's what it sounds like. And if that is what you mean, what else do you expect? I don't know about other states, but in Ohio, our sky is very heavily chemtrailed at sunset to the left and to the right of the sun and often over the sun itself. Chemtrails, uh-huh. By which you mean clouds, right? According to some random websites I'm not going to bother to cite because I'm not making an argument about it, Ohio is one of the cloudier states, yeah. Does that have some relevance to whether the setting of a giant tan planet seen from Alaska somehow causes a red sky that just so happens to always coincide with the actual sunset? Like, keep a better focus on the point. The southeast facing weather cam in Shavak, Alaska shows the striped planet again. It quickly fades into a transparency from the atmospheric chemicals. Oh no, another outdoor camera got a drop of water on it. How will we survive the invasion of the water droplets? We'd better all beg Jesus to spare us from the horrors to come. Oh, but right, it faded away from the atmospheric chemicals. Or I should say, into atmospheric chemicals, specifically water vapor. We're saved! Although to be fair, I think it probably is still there, just not being lit up anymore. But I had to make a bad joke, it's what I do! Once again, here we see the red, fast-rotating, crater-pocked planet rolling through the sky from the southwest-facing weather cam in Kaufman Cove, Alaska. What am I supposed to be looking at? This? Yeah, that's a lens flare. You see how it's moving in perfect sync with that arch-shaped flare in the bottom right and the sun in the top left? Pretty weird behavior for a planet. Pretty mundane behavior for a lens flare. The southwest-facing weather cam in Craig, Alaska, 
shows the sun eclipsing a large planet with a very large crater hole in it. Oh, I thought you'd say something like, the sun simulator malfunctioned and accidentally grew hair. The contrast enhanced pictures show the planet and its detail much better. <sighs> That's a dust speck. Do I seriously need to demo something like that? Like, I just cleaned my lens after I stuck a bunch of water droplets all over it. All the out-of-focus water droplets kind of look like dust. Actually, now that I say that, this could actually just be a water droplet, too. I wonder if there's anyone out there who both believes this and also wears glasses. I'd say it's pretty hard to do both. Probably most people who wear glasses have at some point looked at one of the little bits of dust stuck on them and know exactly what I'm talking about. Speaking of which, it was a huge pain to see the screen on my camera while I was taking videos of the sun for this. It had been a while since I cleaned my glasses, so I constantly had these little planets popping in and out of view every time I moved or the light changed. I probably should have just washed my glasses. If none of that is enough for you, eh, whatever. You can do all this stuff yourself for not that much money. Get a camera with a decently large lens that'll collect dust well and leave the lens cap off in a dusty house for a while and then film a light source. You probably have to play around with the settings a little to get it to happen the way you're looking for, but it will work. It's not hard, it's basic photography, and it's incredibly common to see this effect in photos as a result. So common that a different flavor of people who don't understand cameras made a hobby out of photographing them and calling them spirit orbs, i.e. ghosts. Oh my god, there's a whole crazy solar system around those bushes! Save me Jesus, we're all gonna- Whoa, is that a crater? Wow, this- Contrast enhanced pictures show the ghost and its detail much better. And in the last contrast photo, it's obvious that there are two planets. You know, at least I could see the dust speck. Where's the second thing? No idea. Get on with it. Here again is the red fast rotating planet that we see on many of the weather cams throughout Alaska and Canada. This one is the southeast facing camera in Craig, Alaska. Lens flare. Again. Come on. This same planet is very viewable from the south facing weather cam in Edna Bay, Alaska. Chemtrails cross in front of it but fail to hide it from view. A close up shows the many craters on this planet. Oh, neat. Another lens flare. <sighs> Okay, see how it's moving? Yeah, well, if this was a video and that camera was moving around, you'd be seeing that object move around in the sky as fast as you'd like. Kind of like these lens flares. I made these with my old camcorder that I used to make videos on, and you can see how radically different the flares look from the ones in my current camera. That's because lens flares are caused by light bouncing around in the lens, and so the structure of the lens, or really all the different lenses inside of the lens, can make lens flares from one camera look completely different from ones in another camera. And that's why I can't reproduce the exact lens lens flares from these FAA weather cams. Because not only do I not own the lens they're using, but I don't even know what lens it is. So the camcorder's making a lot more flares than these FAA cams are getting, but you see the similarities. There's a smaller reddish flare closer to the light source, larger circular flares closer to the middle of the screen, and then a very large flare at the edge opposite the light source. And take a close-up look at the circular flare. A close-up shows the many craters on this lens flare. In Elam, Alaska, the sun took on a very odd shape for at least 10 minutes, one frame. I already showed how that effect works, go on. In Fort Yukon, the sun appeared to be the shape of an anvil. From the south-facing weather cam, we saw this. That's just sunlight being scattered by the clouds with some extra dark clouds around the middle blocking some of the light and only allowing the more direct light from nearer the actual sun to reach your eyes. Do you not know there's a difference between the light source and the light itself? Is that part of the problem here? Even covered with clouds, the anvil shape is still there. No, not despite being covered with clouds. Because it's covered with clouds, the anvil shape is there. Which is why in your second picture, with much less cloud around the middle, the shape is so much less pronounced, and why, if you had bothered to look at the pictures from after the clouds cleared, it wouldn't have been there at all. Look, if you need an illustration, check out the sequence from our favorite camera, the south-facing Drumheller Airport Cam. The clouds and sun are doing the same thing here. The northwest-facing weather cam in Tok, Alaska, shows a very fast-rotating, colorful, striped, large planet. After a few frames, the red planet comes into view also. Some contrast is added to these enlargements in order to see the details of the planets better. Its stripes and its rotation really show up in a couple frames, showing how fast this object is rotating. Do they show that though? Because see, to me the fact that there's zero consistency between these stripes in any of the shots is 
very suspicious. If this is a planet, in every single shot it looks like a completely different planet. In fact, the only thing that seems at all consistent is that its appearance matches the sunlight coming at the camera. When the sun's up above the clouds and we have no sharply defined rays through the clouds, the planet is blue, stripeless, and barely visible. Later on, when the sun gets a little bit lower and its light is split into faint white rays, the planet starts to get white patches and stripes. When the sun moves even lower and starts to cast strongly defined orange rays through the clouds and the clouds create shadows, the planet gets chunky orange stripes and dark shadows. Why is this? A cynic might be tempted to say this is just a bit of stuff on the lens being colored by the light coming into the camera, but dust is a really complicated and unlikely explanation. No, it's far more likely that it's a giant planet that completely changes its appearance every 10 minutes and the sun isn't real, right? The red planet is once again captured on the Toke Alaska Southwest camera. Okay, that's the fourth time you've said you've seen the red planet. From the sounds of it, you think it's the same red planet each time. Here again is the red fast rotating planet that we see on many of the weather cams throughout Alaska and Canada. This same planet is very viewable from the south facing weather cam in Edna Bay, Alaska. After a few frames, the red planet comes into view also. The red planet is once again captured on the Toke Alaska Southwest camera. But this doesn't add up. Let's go through it. So here you have the red planet roughly in the center of the image, slightly to the right, in the southeast facing camera in Craig, Alaska, from around 1200 to 1300. Over that entire hour, it barely moves. You also have it in the south facing Edna Bay camera, moving slowly from left to right from around 1020 to around 1440. That's over four hours, and it hardly makes any progress across the sky. And at 12 o'clock, when it's still nearly in the center of the southeast facing Craig camera, it's also somehow crossing the center of this south-facing camera. It's in the southwest and the south at the same time. Then you also have the planet in the southwest-facing Toke camera from around 1310 to 1450, going from slightly to the left of center towards the right and moving downwards as it sets. And finally, like three hours later, you have it in the northwest-facing Toke camera around 1730 to 1810, apparently having changed its mind about setting in the southwest, and now moving downward from the left of center towards the right, just like it did hours previously in the southwest cam, even starting over from about the same distance above the horizon. So to be very clear, at the same time, on the same day, at 1300, the same planet is seen to the southeast, barely moving, to the south, slowly moving, and to the southwest, setting, all at once. And then, after hanging around for hours in multiple locations simultaneously, and moving at different speeds and directions in each one of them, and after having set somewhere in the southwest, it then moves all the way into the northwest within just a few hours and sets there too. This is really dumb. Let's compare this behavior to a real object, the sun. At 1300, while your red planet is at all kinds of different locations all over the sky at the same time, the sun is off to the right of the southeast facing Craig camera, slightly to the right of center in the south facing Edna Bay camera, and way out of frame to the left of the southwest facing Toke camera. So in other words, it's exactly where you would expect it to be in each one of these cameras at that time, if it's actually real. And in the photos from the northwest facing Toke camera, starting at 1530, it's out of frame to the left already, where it sets. Just like it should. Perfect. See, that makes sense. Your thing makes no sense at all, if it's an actually real planet and not just a bunch of lens flares. So your pictures are actually evidence that this is not a real planet, so why are you presenting it like it's evidence that it is? These objects we have just viewed are part of an approaching celestial system. Many people ask when this system will make its closest pass to our Earth. A general indication of time is provided in the following screens of text. Okay, sure, but before we get to that, I have a serious question for you. Instead of spending all your time looking at weather cams on the internet, did you ever actually just go outside and look up? Not directly at the sun, of course, unless you have eclipse glasses or a telescope with a solar filter like I do. Which, by the way, is pretty cheap. Mine's nothing special. You can do this yourself. I took this video of the sun in case you're curious whether it's black or whatever. Should go without saying, it's not. Oh, hey look, I got photobombed by a bird. Cool. But you seem to think the sky is just chock full of visible planets. So did you go see for yourself without the interference of camera tech? Or are these totally real objects coincidentally only visible with cameras prone to weird lens effects and not with a naked eye? And if so, why? Are cameras like the real life version of the glasses from They Live?
Well, if that's what you believe, you should probably immediately run out and get one of those magical devices and start trying to film the sky while the sun's out. You'll very likely see your planets. But once you notice that with a moving camera, those planets and the sun's glare blob and everything else you mentioned sweep back and forth across the sky in perfect harmony with the motion, or in some cases disappear when you carefully clean your lens, consider asking yourself why that is. And now for the Christian propaganda part. These objects are part of an approaching celestial system that will greatly affect the Earth during the biblically foretold Great Tribulation. Sadly, mainstream news is prohibited from discussing this inbound system and the Earth changes it brings. Mainstream news is prohibited from talking about them by, well, in reality by the people who decide what'll make an interesting story, I guess. Breaking news! Lens flares exist! is not exactly worthwhile. Our Earth's end was predicted by the Holy Bible's Old Testament prophets and by Christ in several places throughout the New Testament. Ah yes, that famous verse from the Old Testament. Therefore I tell you, your solar system will be invaded by massless planets indistinguishable from lens flares and dust specks. Be afraid! Be very afraid! Not everyone will have to face the disaster. Christ instructs us in the Bible, Luke 21, 34 through 36, to remain watchful, living in holiness and prayer so that we may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. I'm a bit disappointed you didn't say exactly what will come to pass. We have all these planets surrounding us like a Vogon constructor fleet. What are they gonna do? Just sort of be there, doing nothing? Or are they suddenly going to acquire mass and just crash into the earth all at once? If you want us scared, you gotta give us some details. To be accounted worthy, basically shut up and be a Christian. This is an even dumber way than Pascal's wager to scare people into converting. But I guess that's probably the point, right? Kind of like how Nigerian scammers deliberately use outlandish claims to target the most gullible people. Well anyway, this type of conspiracy stuff is really great, I love it. I've got a lot of requests in the past to do Flat Earth videos, but honestly, just arguing about whether the Earth is or is not flat has never interested me much. But there's really off-the-wall stuff in the same general vein as Flat Earth, but different. Like the Electric Sun video I did, or the Mirror Moon, or this. These really appeal to me, and I've been discovering more conspiracy theories like them, so I'll probably do more. I kind of like the idea of making 2019 the year of weird for this channel. What do you think? Give the video a like if you're into that idea, and subscribe if you want to to see more stuff like this. And if you want to support my channel, you can do that on Patreon, like all these wonderful people on the screen, or by any of the other methods I have listed at support.logic.com. Thanks everyone for watching, and see you soon!